appear presentable to people. And, uh, you know, you get dressed, you get your tie and everything, you comb your hair. And then, uh, and then you go to church and you hit your head on the back of your car door. And so, so that's what happened. And uh, you're all going, what in the world? Why? Uh, this is the first aid kit is what this is. And so uh, forgive me for that. Bear with me. But uh, I feel okay. I'm just doing this for your own sake to cover it up. But this morning we're talking about prayer. And we've been talking about prayer for the last four or five weeks. And uh, this morning the title of the lesson is Pray for Christ's Sake. And uh, we're going to learn what it means to do things for Christ's sake, including prayer. We know not how to pray, Romans 8, 26 says. And that's the theme of this series, Teach Me to Pray. Uh, we need to first learn, as Garrett pointed out in this dispensation, we don't know everything when we get saved. Unlike in the, in the New Te Covenant, New Testament, where they were promised the Holy Spirit to teach them things and give them the words to speak, that is not what's happening today. And so we are saved after hearing the gospel. Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead, and we trust that. And then we have learning to do. You know, we're just as ignorant as we were the day before, only now we're saved by God's grace. He did the work. And so there's a lot of learning that we are told to do, and we have a book from which to learn. And so praise God for that. And including prayer, we need to learn how to pray. That first lesson was just realizing that point. We need to learn how to pray. Uh, get rid of the idea that pray, you're going to pray naturally the right way. We don't know how to pray as we ought, is what Romans 8 says. Then we moved on to talk about our prayer perspective and how our perspective needs to be changed about prayer. Typically, in our ignorance, and it's natural in our ignorance to think, well, there's a God who can do things, and he's a loving God and a powerful God, and we need things, and so we're going to ask, ask, and request, and, and plead and, and to God to get things. And when we learn from Scripture what God has done for us and all the grace he's given us, then our perspective can change in our prayers to the degree that we can now know what he's done. We can give thanks for what he's done. Yeah. Right? Uh, you cannot give thanks if you don't know what someone's done for you. And so it's natural to pray to God for forgiveness and pray to God for salvation and pray to God for help and mercy and need. And then you learn in the Bible what he's provided. And so our perspective on prayer changes Amen. with that. And, uh, and, and we still pray. And so the third lesson we had was about praying God's will and how it's important when you pray to know God's will. We use Jesus' prayer in the garden as an example where he prayed before he died on the cross, not my will but thine be done. And it's not a bad pattern for us to pray as well. In our prayers, people typically think, well, this is my time to vote, give my vote to God on what he should do. Uh, rather, it's you need to align yourself with the will of God. That's what prayer is supposed to do, align yourself with God's will so that when you pray, you can pray your will be done, not mine. And last week, we dealt with prayer, an aspect of it being spiritual and how we're spiritual beings. And even though we live in a physical world and have mortal bodies and have needs physically and in this world, uh, we know that God is working today through spiritual means, through the scripture, through saving souls, regenerating our spirits, and giving us understanding, as again Garrett talked about this morning. And so prayer is a spiritual activity. It's something we do in our flesh that engages our spirit, and it's communicating to God who is spirit. And so we pray spiritual requests. We pray spiritual things, and God works in us that way. It's only when you know what God is doing that you appreciate that, right? And so this is another thing we learn in prayer. This week, we need to learn who we are in Christ and how that doctrine affects our prayers under grace. How does knowing that we're members of the body of Christ, how does knowing who we are and what Christ has done for us affect how we pray today? Ignorance in flesh, we left off last week, is usually what confounds our prayer. Either we don't know how to pray, and so there, there's that. Praise God that he gives us the spirit to intercede for us when we don't know how to pray as we ought but uh, also our flesh, the things that we want for ourselves, our selfishness, that also in, impedes praying properly also. You can still pray the prayer by God's grace, but we need to learn how to pray right. And you can learn, and we have been. At one time in the Bible, in time past, prayer access to God uh, wasn't as easy as it is now. Of course, everyone would throw up prayers to heaven, but there would be a realization that he is God after all, the creator, the maker. He is so much higher than us, and we're just these little people that have these short temporal lives that trying to access God or get him to hear our prayers was a really important subject. Uh, you see this in the scripture as well. And prayer access to God was through covenant standing. God made a covenant with Israel saying, I will hear your prayer. I will deal with you, and I'll respond to you when you respond to me in this covenant relationship. Right? So prayer access was through covenant standing. And so you would pray the covenant. You would pray that covenant, pray what God said there. It was through position 
It may be in a certain place. We saw in, in lessons past that you'd go to the temple in Israel or pray toward that temple. And so it had to do with that place. It had to do with your position. It had to do with your heart being circumcised or not, whether God would hear your prayer. Right? And so all of these uh, concern prayer access. Or the authority. When Jesus came, all through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, a, an important subject was the name of Jesus. And John 20, 31 writes the whole gospel of John so that you might believe in his name, that he is the Christ, in the name of God. And so they would pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Even today, people will pray in the name of Jesus Christ, which is not a wrong thing to do. Uh, but the authority there of the name was important. Why was that important? To get access to God, right? Whereas before, it was through a covenant, through a temple, through the priest. Not everyone could. And yet, now with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we can access the Father. So you'd pray in his name. Is what Jesus taught them to pray. And so prayers uh, were limited by access. In fact, in the Old Testament, prayers could be abominable. I don't know if you've read some passages of the Old Testament about hindered prayers or not, but in Proverbs 15, verse 29, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Well, there it is. God will only hear your prayer if you're righteous in Proverbs 15, 29. Again, thank God for his grace. There's none righteous, no, not one. It's to him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, ungodly, that his faith is counted for righteousness. And so we are those who are sinners that Christ died for, and so we are not righteous in ourselves. Does that mean God doesn't hear our prayers? The answer is no, of course, he hears every prayer that you pray. That's because of his grace. Amen. In Proverbs 28, verse 9, it says, He that turns away his ear from hearing the law. Are you under the law? No. Do you study the law day and night? Do you meditate on the law day and night, Joshua 1 says? No. Well, he that turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Yeah, that's serious business, an abominable prayer. So it's not true that in every dispensation at all times, God said, go ahead, everybody, just throw them at me. I can take it. He said, I will only hear the prayers of the righteous, those who listen to what I say, right? And the rest he calls abominable. In Psalm 109, you ever heard of imprecatory prayers? <laughs> it has to be a really bad political season for Christians to pray imprecatory prayers, <laughs> apparently. But uh, <laughs> even though you, you ought not pray those prayers in this dispensation, for other reasons. And precatory prayers are prayers that you pray against your enemies. You ever done that? Ho hopefully not, if you know it sense grace. But in the Bible, there's plenty of examples of it. Psalm 109, David prayed a lot of them. Under the covenant to Israel, there was a clear distinction between God's people and those who were not. And if those who were not God's people came against God's people, didn't bless them, then they became God's enemies. And so praying against God's enemies was a righteous thing. It'd be much like you praying against the devil today, right? God's enemy. Psalm 109, though, is in a precatory prayer. Verse 1 says, Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. Now, I'm not singing this, but this would be a song that would be sung, right? It's a song. Right? So uh, you have to create your own tune to this, this lyric here. Uh, it says, They compassed me about also with the words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. See, see the judgment, the prayer for judgment against him? He says, when he shall be judged, verse 7, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. Wow. David was just praying here that the prayer of his enemies would be a sin to God. Apparently, that was a thing in time past. And you can read the rest of the chapter there about the imprecatory nature of him uh, condemning his enemies who were against him and thus against God's anointed. So prayers could be wrong. They could be sinful. They can be abominable. Requests, look at Hebrews 4. Requests were taken to a throne, were taken to a temple. You came to the priest, to the, to the temple, to offer those requests. In Hebrews 4, even the New Testament written to Israel about their new covenant, talks about coming to a throne with requests. Hebrews 4, verse 16, he says, Let us therefore come boldly. Now, the difference between the Hebrews and the New Covenant and Hebrews and the Old Covenant was that in the New Covenant, Jesus had come. That's a big difference. Yeah. The Holy Ghost had been poured out of them on Pentecost. It's a big difference. But it's still a covenantal relationship. And it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Where do you find grace and get mercy? When you come to the throne of grace. 
right? You approach it that way with your request. So you request it humbly, and you're able to get that access because Christ is the mediator of the new covenant. That's how you get help. Today, however, in the dispensation of God's grace that we live under, where God has given you salvation by grace and all spiritual blessings, we have access to God through prayer, by faith, not our works, through Christ, not through a covenant, and into God's grace, where when we stand. Romans 5 talks about that, Romans 5, verse 2. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there goes the abominable prayers and sinful prayers, right? We have peace with God. So what happens when you pray today and you're the unrighteous one? Well, if you're justified by faith, you're at peace with God, it says. By whom also we have access by faith unto this grace wherein we stand. You stand in grace by faith. You don't stand in grace because you're keeping it by your good works or actions or love for Jesus. It's Romans 5, 2, by grace, which is Christ's work for you, that you stand and you rejoice in hope the glory of God. Amen. Well, concerning prayer, this means we have access to God through prayer by grace through faith. Yeah. So we ought not take that for granted. That because of our position in Christ, we're able to pray and he hears all of our prayers, even when we don't pray as we ought. Right. Romans 8, 26. And so if you're going, well, I don't know. These lessons are difficult. I'm still trying to learn. I don't know if I'm going to pray right. Well, Romans 8, 26 says you should pray. And you don't know how to pray as you ought, but the Spirit makes intercession for you according to the will of God. Amen. And that's a grace that God's given you, right? Even when you don't pray right, he knows your heart. Wow. That's even different than coming to the throne with a certain request. That's like, I don't even know what to say. And God knows what you need, right? That's a special privilege we have in the dispensation of grace. Ephesians 3, verse 12 also talks about the access we have to God through Christ according to his grace. Ephesians 3, of course, talks about the revelation of the mystery and what God's doing in this dispensation. But he says, in Christ we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So it's through Christ himself that we have access to God, to, to being in this fellowship, this new creature. All right. So prayer access has changed over time in the scripture. And the reason why is because of who you are. Because of what the Bible says now that you are in Christ as the church, the body of Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 30 says, We are members of his flesh, and we are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30 says, We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You are a new creature in Christ. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. The old way that God dealt with humanity through covenants has passed away. Now you're in him. You have communion with him. Right. We, therefore, we pray as members of Christ's body. Yeah. We pray as the temple of God. We want to find the temple and find the throne. You are the temple of God. No, you're not. 1 Corinthians 3.16, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You're the temple of God. That means our prayers are done in his body. I mean, you knew you remember the body of Christ. We're talking about prayer. How do they concern each other? Well, you are the body of Christ. That means when you pray, you're praying in his body. And that means something. That's an effect. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Christ is not bodily on earth today in his glorified flesh. He's in heavenly places. The head is there. But he has a body on earth, and that's you. Amen. In Colossians 3, verse 3, it says, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Your mind needs to be changed about who you think you are. Right? Your prayers are done in his body. Look at Colossians 3.17. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever ye do, I think that includes prayer. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, that definitely would be prayer, which is a deed and you speak words, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, how, how can we claim the Lord Jesus? You're a member of his body. Amen. You don't simply claim him because you're God's people or you have a covenant relationship with him or that he's chosen you. It's because you're members of his body. Right? He says, do all name the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Every time you see giving thanks in the scripture, think prayer. Because you cannot give thanks without prayer. Giving thanks to God and the Father. Notice those last two words. By him. When you pray, even though Christ is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? You're his body. When you pray, you're praying in his body by Christ. That's interesting. When you pray, you should pray with that position, knowing who you are, because otherwise your prayer, God isn't concerned with prayers, except for Christ and his grace, and you're in him. Look at Colossians chapter 1. 
Colossians 1, we, we go here frequently to describe and define the mystery that, that Paul's been given, but talking about prayer today, what does this mystery concern our prayers? In Colossians 1, 27, it says, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, though he be in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, Christ in you. You're the body of Christ, and you in him, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The thinking is that, well, the prayers that Christ would pray, those are special prayers. The garden prayer, John 17, like the Father's going to hear that guy. You know, he's going to, you're the members of the body of Christ. When you pray, you're praying in his body. You're praying by Christ. That's your access to the Father because you're in him. And Colossians 1, 27 and 28, 29 says, Paul labors. Look at verse 29. I also labor, striving according to Christ's working, which works in me mightily. Paul says he's trying to minister to make you see that Christ is in you, and he's doing that according to how Christ works in him. Do you see that? He's ministering by Christ's work in him so that you might know that Christ is also in you, so that you could also minister by Christ in you. You see, we're talking about prayer here. You need to learn the doctrine so that you know when you work, when you live, when you walk, when you pray, you're praying as members of the body of Christ. And we forget this. Yeah. We think it's us and God's up there and Jesus is up there and we're praying up there. Well, you're a member of his body. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. We're not praying to a distant God up there. We're praying to a God that dwells in you and by Christ who dwells in you. This is some spiritual stuff here. You go, well, this is kind of hard to grasp. I get it, but this is what the scripture says. That definitely should affect our prayers. In the Old Testament, if you were against God's people, your prayers are sinful and abominable. If you were wicked, God's not going to hear your prayers. Now you're a part of his body, Amen. and he dwells in you. What a privilege, what a grace that is. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. A few of these verses Garrett went through this morning. Presented them properly in their context. God's will, as we covered a few weeks back, for you today is to be in the body of Christ, saved, and come to a knowledge of the truth. And part of that truth that he wants you to come to knowledge, uh, knowledge of is this right here, is Christ in you. Okay? His will for the body of Christ is to be filled to the full with him. Amen. The lesson this morning was to be filled with the Spirit. That's what he wants for you. He didn't do it for you when you got saved. You're sealed with the Spirit. He dwells in you. To be filled requires you to come to the Word of God and eat it and live it and pray it, and then you get filled with God's Word and activate that Spirit within you. Ephesians 1.23, notice the filling over Ephesians. Where in Ephesians, uh, this is a part of Paul's prayer there. He makes prayers for the Ephesians. This is a glorious prayer. We studied this yesterday. But it's a prayer for understanding and wisdom and enlightenment and revelation and the power, you know, the power that, that uh, works in you. In verse 19, is his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And then down in verse 23, this power that is Christ in you that he gives to you because of Christ. He says in verse 22, he hath put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So that position and the power and the glory that's given to Christ says he's given it to the church, Amen. which is you which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. God wants you to recognize who you are and what he's done and accomplished for you, what he's given for you, given to you. Look at Ephesians 3.19. Ephesians 3, I need another prayer in, in Ephesians by Paul. He's here bowing his knees to the Father. And he says in verse 19 that he prays that they may know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. You know, there's knowing you're saved, and then there's knowing the truth of your position in Christ. Those are, those are different things. Being saved is trusting what Christ did for you by his grace, it's not your works. You come to knowledge of what he did for you and who you are is a different story altogether. Knowing your identity, knowing how to walk, knowing your titles and your access to spiritual blessings, what are those spiritual blessings? What are the good works he'd have us do? Knowing here the love of Christ, you say, oh, I know the love of Christ, he died for me. That's not the extent of it. Look at verse 18, that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. It goes beyond that. We were just studying that in Romans chapter 8. It's not just that he died for you. Romans 8 says there's nothing that is able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. And Romans 8 tells you why that is. We've been studying that on Tuesdays. And Paul prays that you might know. By the way, you want to, you want to pray for something? That right there is a good one. God, I pray that I would know your love, right, to the breadth, length, depth, and height that you revealed it. 
which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see the fullness of God there? That's what God wants. Not just to know things. It's not just learn, learn, learn. It's learn so that you might be filled with the fullness of God, that you may be able to walk, that you may be able to bear the fruit of God. Right? So you get the fullness of God in Ephesians 3, verse 19. It, look at Ephesians 4, verse 12. You have those gifts that were given to men, some prophets and apostles and evangelists, pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith. And so, of course, those gifts have an end, which is why the word till is there. And of the knowledge of the Son of God. So it's till you come to a knowledge of what? The perfect man. The complete man. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You see, that's what's going on here. It's that the body of Christ was created to be the, the filled with his fullness, and you have to know what that is by studying Scripture here. And Paul says, you don't need these supernatural gifts if you have this knowledge of God's love toward you. Right? You have access to those things. You can pray on your own. You don't need someone else to pray. Sometimes people have asked me that. They say, well, you pray because I'm not good at praying. You pray for me. And I understand that we pray with each other and for each other. But, you know, it, just because I pray doesn't mean it gets to God faster. Or that I pray a better prayer, a good-sounding prayer with enticing words, doesn't mean that God doesn't understand what you're trying to pray. Just because you don't know what to pray doesn't mean you aren't the Holy Spirit in you. You see? So, I mean, every member of the body is a member of the body. And so, with all those uh, riches that we have in Christ Jesus. But you see the fullness there of Christ in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. Look at Ephesians 5, 18, which we studied this morning. Be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So you have the fullness of God in Ephesians 3, you have the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 4, you have the fullness of the Spirit in Ephesians 5. It's Father, Son, and Spirit, isn't it? It's like the Godhead. He wants, you to, be, he wants to dwell in you in fullness. He wants you to appreciate what that is. Which means, again, this speaks to God's grace because he's done it for you. We simply have to acknowledge and, and, and learn and, and appreciate what he's done. That's God's will, members of the body of Christ. And so when we pray, we're praying to a God who indwells us. Amen. Our prayers should probably acknowledge that union, which means the popular song and prayer, come Holy Spirit, come dwell within me, not informed, right? I'm sure many people pray that prayer well-intended, and it proves the point of the Scripture that we know not how to pray as we ought, yes. right? Because know you not, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. Well, I didn't know that. So you're going, I prayed that prayer a lot. Well, no one knows how to pray as they ought until they learn. But when you learn the Holy Spirit dwells in you, you probably won't pray that prayer anymore. <coughs> Come dwell in me, Holy Spirit. Oh, I remember. He's already there. Right? So moving on to the next request until you learn something else. 1 Corinthians 3.16, you're the temple of God. And so when we pray, we pray as members of the body of Christ, with God indwelling us, and uh, we learn a pattern from Paul in Romans 15 where he says he beseeches the Romans to pray for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And what I'm trying to present that this means is that you're praying for his will and for his purpose. You're praying to glorify what he did for you, who you are in him, who he is in you, what his ministry is trying to perform through you. That's what it means to pray for Christ's sake. It's the opposite of praying for your own sake, right? And this seems to be the consistent theme throughout our lessons, that the things you want matter far less than what God wants. And when we start trusting what he wants is actually what's going to happen and what is good for our growth, then our prayers change accordingly. Amen. And so praying for Christ's sake means you have to know who you are in Christ. It's not just thy will be done, though that would be a true prayer as well. It's that I'm in you and you in me. I'm your body. I'm praying as a member of the body of Christ. Right? Let's look at Luke 18 as an example of this. How does this look like in practicality in, in prayer? Look at Luke 18. Very popular prayer in Luke 18 that, that Christians pray, especially in evangelistic services. Of course, we're going back to Luke, which means we're going back before the revelation of the mystery, before there's the knowledge of the body of Christ and the fellowship of the mystery of Christ, who you are in Christ. Here Christ has come to Israel and he's preaching that he is the king. He's just preaching his name. I am Christ. My name's Jesus, means salvation, and I am Christ. I am the anointed prophesied one. So we're learning the history of Christ here, not the mystery of Christ. Right? And in Luke 18, down in verse 9, 
Jesus is speaking a parable, and he, he spoke this parable unto a certain which trusted in themselves. Not a good thing. Anywhere in the scripture, you should be trusting God, not yourself. But they're trusting in themselves. These aren't people who disbelieve in God, by the way, because they're, they're going to be praying to God. They're people that believe in God, right? They're even Israel, but they're trusting in their own work. And he said, wasn't Israel given responsibility to do works? Didn't we just read that he doesn't hear the prayers of the wicked? Yep, we did. So here's some people trusting in themselves. God, hear the prayer of your righteous servant. <laughs> That's what's going on here. That they were righteous and despised others. The problem wasn't that they were trying to do right or all the things they're going to pray here was, was good, according to what God said. Is that they were not appreciating what God would work through sinners. Right? They didn't know that. They were despising others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. This is what people call the sinner's prayer. Right? It's what people are led through, or at least taught to, in evangelism when they say, well, you know, we need to lead you through this prayer. But notice, just as a change of context a little bit for you here, uh, the first person's prayer, the Pharisee. By the way, Pharisees, uh, Pharisee does not mean bad, evil man, you know, as, as sometimes Christian culture presents it, even though often they're being rebuked in Matthew, Luke, and John. Worse than a Pharisee was a Sadducee. Worse than a Sadducee was a Gentile. Right? That's how it worked in Israel's system. Okay? A Pharisee was one who took the scriptures literally. The reason why Jesus interacts with them so much, because Jesus wrote the scripture to be read literally. And so he interacts with them because even those who are closest to the understanding of scripture are getting it wrong. Yeah. Right? That's what's going on there. So the Pharisee is the one who knows scriptures, taking it literally. They ended up stumbling over Jesus. But the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you. Now, wait, th doesn't Paul tell us that everything give thanks? Not a bad start, right? I thank you. Well, for what? I thank you that I am not as other men. Oh, <laughs> there's the self-righteousness. I thank you I'm not as other men are extortioners, unjust adulterers. Now, if you hate sin, which you should under grace even, grace doesn't mean it's okay to love sin. I mean, grace should lead you to the knowledge that, you know, you're going to die for your sins and Christ showed his love to pay for my sins. And so sin should be a burden even now under grace. Yeah. Something you should despise, right? And so here's a man despising sin. I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner anymore, right? Well, I mean, shouldn't we be glad that your brother and sister's not a sinner? You, you see what's going on here. Jesus is pointing out a condition of his heart, right? Something he doesn't understand. Of course, we know people don't know how to pray as they ought. But here's the Pharisees saying, I'm not unjust. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not even as this publican over here. <laughs> And it's going to be his downfall. By the way, this is a parable here, right? He says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. By the way, that's obeying the law. Yeah. What did Proverbs say? If you hear my law, you know, that's good. If you don't hear my law, it's an abomination when you pray. He says, I'm doing the law. This publican, he's not doing any of that, mm. right? The publican stands afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thus the sinner's prayer is what they people call it there. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. The difference was the humility, right? There was no humility in the Pharisees' prayer. So even though God told Israel to keep the law and told them that here's the prayers of the righteous, the proper orientation for Israel was to come to God and saying, be merciful to me because I've broken your law. Have the honesty and the truth to say, I'm not righteous. David wasn't, right? Moses wasn't. Right? A, lot, a lot of the, the men that God chose to work through in the Old Testament committed sins, also recorded in Scripture. And so they need to have some humility, right? needing forgiveness from God. Anyway, I'm just teaching the context of Luke 18, but we're talking about praying for Christ's sake. Today's lesson, the sinner's prayer does not mention Christ at all. Do I have to mention Christ in every prayer? Well, it wouldn't hurt, but you know, there's not a rule. But my point is that the, prayer, the sinner is praying to God to be merciful to him a sinner, Christ hadn't died yet, right? If you and I were to pray, God, give me mercy, please. Dispense your grace to a sinful world. He's done it. Amen. When you know what he's done, the humility should still be there. I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying for my sins. If you know what Christ has done for you, then you'll pray accordingly. This man doesn't know what God's done for him. He's pleading for it. And in his place, in his dispensational place, that's the right thing to say. And even today in your sin, you may plead God for mercy. I mean, you're, you see the disgusting nature of sin. But you have to acknowledge, if you're going to pray for Christ's sake, you've got to know what Christ has done. 
God gets glorified when you appreciate what he's already done for you, instead of ignoring it. Right? Now, Luke 18, is not, that's not what's happening. Christ hadn't died yet. This is why this prayer is not really a good one to teach people, especially who are newly converted, to pray because you sh they should know about their sins. They should not be proud. Right? You should use the law to get them to the point where they acknowledge their sins. But show them how God committed his love toward them while they are yet sinners. He died for them. Amen. And then they'll praise God for the glory of his grace. Right? That, that's how that works. The disciples' prayer in Matthew chapter 6 popularly known as the Lord's Prayer, which I don't like calling it that just because, uh, not only am I a contrarian sometimes, but because uh, Matthew 6, Jesus would never pray that prayer himself. He was asked to instruct them how to pray, and he was instructing them how to pray, but Jesus would never pray to the Father, forgive me my sins as I forgive others. He had no sins. Right? So it was a prayer that he would never pray at all. But that prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, asking for the bread every day, for forgiveness of sins as we forgive other people, which is a conditional forgiveness, it does not mention what Christ did on the cross anywhere in that prayer. It does not include Christ's payment for sins. Why would you and I, in this dispensation, pray that prayer the way it's written, when we know he gives forgiveness to us by his grace according to his shed blood on the cross, not how you forgive your neighbor? Because that prayer says, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And Jesus even explains afterward, in case you think that's a small point, Jesus explains right after that instruction that because if you don't forgive other people, the Father in heaven won't forgive you. Wouldn't that be the right place for Jesus to explain, if he wanted to, that I'm going to die for your sins. It's going to be a gracious act. My bloodshed will pay for your sins, so trust my payment. Nope, he didn't do it. That's the most popular prayer in Christianity, folks, Matthew 6. And it does not have in it the acknowledgement of what Christ did on the cross. Praying for Christ's sake is to acknowledge what Christ did and who we are. Every time we sin, we don't fall back into an unregenerate state where we have to plead to God for mercy again and ask Him to put us into His good standing because we are in His body, sealed with the Holy Ghost. And don't make that be a moment of pride for you, right? I mean, you're the sinner that He died for. It's by His grace. But our prayers should acknowledge who we are and what He's done. That's how you glorify Christ in your prayers, to acknowledge what He's done. It doesn't glorify Christ to pray as if He never did it. Right, the sinner's prayer, Matthew 6, which is where those prayers are. So Ephesians 4.32, with the knowledge of what Christ did, Paul says about forgiveness, to forgive others for Christ's sake. Isn't that what he says? Ephesians 4.32, be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, because if you don't forgive one another, Christ or God won't forgive you. No, that's not what he says. He says, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because of what Christ did, for Christ's sake, to glorify what Christ did, forgive other people, because he's forgiven you, right? He has already forgiven you for Christ's sake. So we're going to pray for Christ's sake. What's that mean? It means we acknowledge what Christ did already. Right? We've already seen that in different other ways, how it changes our perspective on being grateful or not. Here we're talking, seeing how it changes our prayers um, and what we request. Look at 1 Corinthians 1. Look how Paul, in his statements let alone his prayers, are ref reflected by what he now knows God has made us in the body of Christ. First Corinthians 1. Look at this passage on unity in the church, which is rightly often used to talk about divisions in the church. But I'm going here to show you how Paul is expressing this desire. He says, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, like, this is serious. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I beseech you, by knowing what Christ did and who you are in Christ, by his name, by what he is to us, that you all speak the same thing. So he doesn't just say, I wish you guys would get along. Like, he could have said something like that. But he says, I beseech you by the name of Jesus Christ that there be no divisions. What does Christ have to do with no divisions? It's not simply that God is love and we need to love one another. That's not simply what it is. It's that you in Christ are made one body. Amen. That's the truth. And so we're members one of another. And knowing that truth, Paul says in the name of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you today and who you are in him, there will be no divisions. That's why he says that. So the doctrine of what God's doing today through you and who you are affects that instruction. It can affect your prayer as well. <clears throat> 
in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4, now that's, that's a, a cry for unity because of Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 4. Here's a cry for division and separation in the same book. By the, for the same reason. Because of Christ. For Christ's sake. 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 4. The issue here is that there's some sins going on. And not just sins, generally speaking, but there's fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles. The one should have his father's wife. And, there, and the real issue wasn't even the sin, which could be forgiven. It's verse 2, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned. That's really the problem. Like there's this egregious sin that's not only affecting these people individually, but everyone else in the assembly, and nobody cares. That's the problem. And so Paul says in verse 3, Verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, I have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that done this deed. And look what he says in verse 4. He doesn't immediately say, kick him out. <laughs> That's the summary, right? But what he says in verse 4 is, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What? Now, he's not just invoking some higher authority here for his declaration of kicking this man out of the assembly. He, he's talking about because of what Christ has done for you and who, who he's made us to be, one body, right? Because of what's going on here, divisions being created by this sinner and the group by not acknowledging the sin. And so he says, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in unity, in my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has to explain verse 4 before he gets to verse 5, which is, don't you remember what Christ did and who he made us? We're not just a gathering of people who like each other. We are members of one body. Amen. Christ is our head, our one head. Right? He saved us from our sins by his grace. He died for our sins. And here you don't care about your sins? You see how that's a problem? Knowing who you are in Christ. So for Christ's sake is what he's saying. For Christ's sake, in verse 5, deliver such a one unto Satan. At least mourn over the thing. Try to deal with it. He goes on chapter 5 and says, deal with the sin. Didn't I tell you not, you know, not to allow that to occur as if it's acceptable? And why? For Christ's sake. Amen. Look at 2 Corinthians 2. Same issue in 2 Corinthians 2. The people he tells to deliver unto Satan, which means to remove them from the gathering of the assembly because they're causing a disunity. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10, same people repent. It worked. The function of the separating from the, the assembly is so that they would acknowledge in themselves that they're causing the division. And we want to be back in union with the group as we are truly in Christ. And they repent. And when they repent, the Corinthians, you know, they're hardcore now. We're not letting you back in. You, you messed up, you know. And Paul writes to the Corinthians saying, you're messing up again. He says, they repent of the sin, you know, and they're like grieving over this, which is the right attitude towards sin, to grieve over it. And he says, you should let them back because grace can deal with the sin. In 2 Corinthians 2, verse 10, look what he says. He says uh, in verse 9, he says, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Amen. Sorry, that's verse 10. He says, I forgave, I forgave it already. He says, you guys should forgive it too. But I forgave it already when I heard of their repentance. And how did he forgive it? Did he just forgive it because Paul's just a good guy? And you know, I, I forgive people. That's what it means to be a good guy. He can justly forgive this egregious sin in the person of Christ for Christ's sake. Amen. If Christ did anything, he died for sins. And there wasn't any sin he didn't die for. And so there is a thing. You say, why were these Corinthians so stubborn? Well, Christians are that way too, like, you know, today. Their sin, sometimes people are like, well, that sin is too far. We cannot accept that. A Christian wouldn't do that. You ever heard that statement? A Christian wouldn't do that? Oh, yeah. What in the world does that mean? Like, every Christian is saved by God's grace. Everyone who's saved was a sinner. Yeah. They just think their sins aren't as bad as that guy's. Well, that's terrible. That's exactly Luke 18 in self-righteousness, isn't it? Yes. Right? And so Paul's saying, if Christ died for all, and they're wanting forgiveness, Christ offers that forgiveness. In the person of Christ Jesus, for Christ's sake, forgive this person. So you see again how for Christ's sake matters a lot in how we do things and who we are. Look at Romans 15, verse 30. Paul requests of the Romans prayer for Christ's sake. You know that phrase, for Christ's sake, people use the curse word, a curse phrase these days. You know, it's just you kind of regurgitate it out. But what the Bible uses the phrase for many times is that word sake means to regard for, on account of, for the purpose of, right? I do this for your sake. What, is, what, am I, what am I saying? I'm doing it regarding you, considering you for your purpose, for your benefit. So for Christ's sake, what does that mean? I'm doing it for Christ's purpose, regarding what Christ is and who he did and his concern. 
as opposed to being selfish, right? And so in Romans 15, verse 30, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Right, so for Christ's sake. Why are, you, why are you praying? He says, for Christ's sake. So you want to know why you should pray in this dispensation? For Christ's sake. Because you are Christ's body, and when you pray, you're in the body of Christ. Your head's in heavenly places. The Spirit dwells in you. Christ is in you. Amen. When you pray, we covered last week, you pray, it, it establishes, it, it acknowledges, it reignites, it connects with the Spirit. You engage the spiritual when you pray, within yourself. And Christ is your head. And so when you start to pray and do anything, and you do it knowing who Christ is and for his sake, you're going to glorify God in that way. Right? And by the way, you do things for Christ's sake, as we'll learn here in a moment, because he did everything for you. Yes. Right? And so it's this gracious response. And that because of that grace first given to you and you respond to him in, in like, likeness, then you know what exhibits out of you? Selflessness and charity and peace and forgiveness. All the things the law required naturally start coming out when you, for Christ's sake, consider what you're doing. Which is why you need Christ, folks. We don't live under a law where it's like, just do good, be good, forgive people. Because there's no reason why you should. And your flesh riles up and says, why should I? And you try to make your flesh do it, but it doesn't want to do it. But when you believe what Christ did, and Christ did this so much for you, you acknowledge what he did. The proper response when you feel the appreciation for a gift is gratitude. And in 2 Corinthians 5.15, doesn't Paul say, if he died for all, then we're all dead. That we which live should not live for ourselves, but to him who died for us. Right? That's the proper mind and response to doing things for Christ's sake. That's what that means. Now, so Paul prays for Christ's sake, and he does it to glorify the word and work of Christ. Um, well, that's what he's going to do. In verse 31 is his actual request. He says, pray for me for Christ's sake, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted in the saints. And thirdly, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. By the way, notice how he's trying to pray the will of God here, right? Uh, three things he prays and says, pray for me for these three things. And these three things aren't like, you know, my hip hurts. And, uh, you know, it's, he's saying, I'm trying to do God's work here. So for, that's why he says, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, for his ministry, pray these things for me. This is what Paul's trying to do. What's interesting about that is none of those three things actually come to pass. Right? So the purpose of prayer in verse 30 for Christ's sake is a good purpose, good orientation. And apparently Paul doesn't really know what to ask. <laughs> So he's going, you know what, for Christ's sake, uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and um, I pray, and I ask you to pray that I will be delivered from them, that do not believe, instead of them killing me, or arresting me, or putting me in chains, or beating me. Uh, and then he goes there, and he gets put in chains, and he gets beaten, and he gets arrested, and threatened to be killed yes. by those in Judea who didn't believe. Right? What is he, a wicked man that God didn't hear his prayers? No, he's justified by faith. Amen. Right? What I'm trying to point out today is why he's praying, which is for Christ's sake. Right? He's praying for that. You will pray things, and they, you don't get what you ask, because he can do abundantly above all that you ask today. He's Amen. given you things. You don't have a lever with God to say, when I say something a certain way in the name of so-and-so, then you have to do. Jesus taught that in John 14, by the way, under Israel's covenant. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, is what he said. But that was under Israel's covenant. And if you read around those verses, he's talking about the Holy Ghost working in them to tell them what to say which would be very helpful. If God would just actually tell me what to say in my prayer, and then it gets answered, then, you know, prayer gets answered. He doesn't tell you what to say. He says, I want you to learn. Well, that means I'm going to fail. When you learn anything, you fail. You know that, right? Like nobody, that, that, you, know, you talk about people being natural. It's like not a real thing. I mean, people have talents and things like that and skills, but like when you try to learn anything, you have to fail before you learn. And the same thing with pray, prayer. And this is Paul failing in prayer. That's <laughs> what's going on here. He's praying with the right heart and the right purpose. He's praying for Christ's sake, and these don't get answered. So it's, it's interesting. I read the Brigham Searchlight uh, this last week, or I think it was last month or somewhere, and they quoted Romans 1530, asking for a prayer request. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, because uh, Paul's prayer request didn't get answered. <laughs> but you know, hey, it's the right purpose, I suppose. You're praying for Christ's sake. But that's what Paul's teaching here. What hit, tends to happen, uh, in, in, or what happens in Israel, uh, Paul's future, is that his service that he takes to Jerusalem Though it, it's accepted by James, didn't James tell him, hey, why don't you take this vow? No, you're, you're, you're about to get run out of town here. And am I coming to you with joy by the will of God? Well, he came to Rome in chains. 
But he was there by the will of God. He eventually got there and he wrote the book of Romans here as a result. In 2 Corinthians 12, we learned about Paul's mind and how he specifically changes his prayer request for Christ's sake. So again, I'm trying to emphasize, we've covered this passage many times in our series, but I'm trying to emphasize the why he's changing his request. It's not simply a rule. Under grace, you don't pray this, you do pray that. It's not how it is. Under grace, God wants your heart to change. He wants your mind to be edified. He wants you to learn according to God's word. He wants to be filled with the Spirit. And here's another example of Paul learning, as is our pattern under grace. And he prays in verse 7, or, or uh, yeah, in verse 8, there was a, a, a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. In verse 8, this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might be to depart from me. And Christ said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. He says, essentially, I've given you what you need, and it's more than sufficient to accomplish what you need in your prayer. And Paul says, what are you talking about? I mean, uh, I can heal myself. That's what my first thought would have been, because Paul could heal people at one point, right, by the power of God. And he's asking for a physical infirmity to be removed. And Jesus says, my grace is sufficient. Paul later says, the signs of an apostle will rot in me. Like, he could do miracles. But he says, this is the lesson I learned, that he wasn't giving me the power to remove this because he wanted me to learn something about his grace, which is that he's given me something to change my heart and my mind so that I can do something for Christ's sake and not my own. Now, his prayer, no doubt, Paul as a minister of Christ is going, remove this thorn in the flesh and I can minister more for you, Lord. But the Lord wanted him to glorify his grace, not himself. Amen. And so he says, most gladly, therefore, Paul gets his mind changed. He learns what Christ taught him. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me, because he doesn't have power. He's still got the thorn in the flesh. He says, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities. Paul says he pleasures. He takes pleasure in injury, in needs, and in pain. That, those are modern synonyms for what he says here. Infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. He does, it's not like they feel good. They're terrible. But it's for Christ's sake. That's why. It's for Christ's sake. So that when he's walking around with an infirmity, he can say, well, good thing it's not me and the way I look and the way I'm injured or healthy or not. It's what Christ did for me. It's his words. Right? So that he can be humbled in the light of what Christ did so Christ can be strong. Right? Because if you're the skilled one, if you're the healthy one, people judge by appearance all the time. I know that full well not having a first aid kit on my head, you know. <laughs> and people say, well, yeah, there's something weird about that guy. You know, yeah, I'm sure. But it's by God's grace that, that we minister, right? And that's what Paul's lesson is here. In 2 Timothy 2, 4, doesn't Paul say that we're soldiers? He tells Timothy to, he says, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Right? Well, that's for the godly ministers, not for the rest of us. We're totally engaged with the affairs of this life. No, there's no man, no man that wars and tangles with the affairs of this life that he may please him. Notice why that is. And we covered this back in 2 Timothy, never so verse. He's not saying to depart this life. You're in this life. You have affairs to deal with. But the reason why you don't entangle yourself with them is that you may please him who chose you to be a soldier. You have a service and a ministry to do. And so for the sake of Christ, you don't entangle yourself with certain affairs that would otherwise inhibit what you could do for Christ's sake. You see, you start making decisions and pray for Christ's sake. And that's the instruction under grace. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Paul says, right after saying that the, explaining the gospel there about the glorious gospel of Christ, he says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. You say, of course, the gospel is Christ. It's not what we do. Yes, now read on. And ourselves, he says, we preach ourselves. Ourselves what? Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We love talking about the grace part of this passage. Glorious gospel, Christ Jesus, not my works. What about that part? And we also preach me as your servant for Christ's sake. And you likewise, right? Do, do you preach that? Preach the gospel of Christ. Yeah, I get that. Do you preach yourself as a servant for others for Jesus' sake? Not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe prayer will help. <laughs> Maybe you should ought to pray for Christ's sake. Right? Maybe change what you're doing things for. Then maybe then you can preach yourselves other servants for Christ's sake. 
Because that's what he wants for you. He wants you to be filled with the fullness of God and the fullness of his grace such that his love works out of you and his grace works out of you. And it's not simply a receptacle of it. Because you were filled with something, Ephesians 5 talks about that, it starts working out. That's what Ephesians 2 says. Our lives are his, right? That means our prayers are his too. The bodies we have, are they, are, are they ours? I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Yeah, we like to quote that. What's that mean, though, when you pray? I'm praying for Christ, right? I walk for Christ. I live for Christ. I speak for Christ. I pray for Christ. That's what Galatians 2.20 means. So your prayers aren't any longer you isolated praying yourself. It's you praying as a member of the body of Christ, crucified in Christ, praying for Christ's sake. Because he's not here. He's in heaven. He's glorified. But you are members of his body. He dwells in you. Philippians talks about this a lot. Philippians is a book talking about the mind of Christ. That's what we're talking about here, changing your mind, your orientation. Praying for Christ's sake is, is going to change your mind so that you can have the mind of Christ. In Philippians 2.21, Paul says, All seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. Well, if you seek your own, not things which are Jesus Christ, then you're not doing things for Christ's sake, are you? Right? So it concerns prayer, it's the same thing. How do people pray? They pray for themselves. Right? You mean they don't pray for the things of Jesus? What does Jesus need? He needs you as a member of his body, right? To be servants to others for his sake. Because he's not here on earth preaching. You're here. Amen. Right? And so in Philippians 2, that's why Paul says that, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not Robert to be equal with God. He's glorified with God in the heavenly places, but he made himself no reputation. He took the form of a servant. That's you, folks. You say, I'm saved by grace. I'm a son of God. I'm an heir of glory. Indeed you are. And I'll take the form of a servant. What? Like, been there. Didn't like it. You know, I was, I was like a slave to sin. He's like, well, now you're a slave to Christ. <laughs> so pray that. Pray for Christ's sake. Your mind has to change, though. Before you willingly do that, you have to have a change of mind. Because I, I can preach, but I can't force you to do that, right? But if your mind is changed, then by Christ. So maybe you ought to study the mind of Christ. Every lesson, by the way, that we've had in our series about being taught to pray seems to concern this issue of changing your mind. First, it was change your mind that you really don't know how to pray. You need to learn. Learn better. Okay, I, I, can, I can grasp that one. Now, now, change your mind that your perspective isn't quite right on prayer. Uh, he's given you so much. And you don't really even know all the depths of it. So maybe you should explore more about what he's done for you. And then pray accordingly. Right? Okay, I, I can be thankful and everything. Okay. Right. Well, you should pray God's will, not yours. I'm getting a little sensitive here. I mean, I've got things I want to do. Right? We need to change your mind. Now, pray for Christ's sake. Like, what do you mean Christ's sake? I've got needs. <laughs> you, know, you see, the selfishness just starts exuding. But you see, what, what, Paul, what God is trying to do is change your mind. From the inside, grace, that's what grace does. This is the power of grace to change your inner man, right? The law could never do that. The law simply said, do this and you're good. And that's what religious people do. They do the so-called laws, attend church, they tithe, they sing the songs a few times, you know, go to the few meetings, and then they're done. <laughs> Did my duty. Grace isn't that. Grace is, we're going to change your inner man, change your soul, and going to change your mind. If I do that, it's going to change everything about my life. Yeah, because you're dead. And your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what it means to be saved and to walk by God's grace. That's what that means. So we have the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16, remember when Paul in 1 Corinthians 2 said, uh, he quoted Isaiah, and he says, uh, no, no, nothing uh, has never entered the mind of man or the eyes of man. He's never seen what God has prepared for them that love him. It's never entered his mind. But then he says, but it's been revealed to us by a spirit. The spirit of God, the word of God now reveals the things that were secret before that we can know. And in verse 16, he says, we have the mind of Christ. Who shall instruct the Lord? He quotes prophecy. And he says, but we have the mind of Christ. What's that mean? We can instruct the Lord? No. It means you can know what the Lord is doing inside you. Right? The reason why you can never instruct the Lord before or be his counselor, because he knows things you don't even know about. And still today, he's beyond us, right? But he has more than any other dispensation revealed who he is in the spirit, and dwelt within you, and describe who that is in you. We have the mind of Christ. That's what that is. In Philippians 1, verse 29, look what Paul says, for Christ's sake. He says, For unto you it is given uh, uh, in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to, man, this part's hard, suffer 
for his sake? I thought the message was he died for my sake. Yes, he did. And now you get put into his body. And what does the body of Christ do? Well, the body of Christ died for my sake. Right, so you should die for other people's sake as well. <laughs> wow. So you should suffer for his sake. There's belief unto life, then there's suffering for his sake. Philippians 2, verse 4 and 5. This is the theme of Philippians, folks, the mind of Christ and doing things for Christ's sake. We already seen Philippians 2, uh, 4 and 5 where we look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. He died for you. And so that's how you should think of your life as well in service to others for Christ's sake. Philippians 3, verse 8 and 9, Paul says it again. He says, Doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. We might intellectually acknowledge this, that Jesus Christ is more excellent than anything. Yes. Right. We can acknowledge that. I'm teaching my son that, and he says that often. He's like, God's greater than waffles. Like, yes, he is. He's greater than everything. He's more excellent. You know, it's like, like it's a, you, can, it, you, can, you can acknowledge the fact of the matter, but when Paul says he counts all things, he reckons it true. This is like a daily operation that's got to happen, because otherwise we would just naturally think that things around us are much more important you know, until we're asked about it. Well, are they more important than Christ? Well, of course Christ is important, but really, is what I need. Mean. So he says, I count these things. This is a daily activity. I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. The things that were his, by the way, the things that he earned, the things he worked for, his career, flushed on the toilet, for Christ. And he goes, good trade. Like, wow, I mean, things that can happen where you lose a lot of things, not on purpose. But to actually respond to that and go, it was worth it. That requires a change of mind about the things that you spent so much effort and energy and life on, right? So that's what I'm talking about here, the mind of Christ. And he says he wants to be found in Christ. He counts him but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. Well, he's already in him, isn't he? Yes, he is in him. He wants to be filled with his fullness. He wants to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Be made conformable unto his death. So there's a lot to learn in there. What does that really mean? There's a lot to learn in there. Grace allows you and helps you through sufferings. Amen. It helps you rejoice in tribulations. <coughs> it helps you understand the sufficiency of God's grace and to, to rejoice in the Lord always. That's what grace does. Amen. And we all have to learn that. Paul Philippians 4 says the same thing. He says, I have learned, which means he didn't know it before, but he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, there ought to be content. I had to learn it. Well, you don't think you're going to have to learn it? Oh, I got it. Read the verse already. You got to learn it. Like, <laughs> it's like not just reading it. It's like it's going to have to happen to you. You're going to have to make choices every day. You're going to have to maybe pray for Christ's sake that you don't fail to learn that lesson. Oh, that's a good prayer. God, I pray that I would learn the lesson Paul learned, but that's a hard thing to pray, folks, because the lesson he learned was a hard lesson, <laughs> right? You ever knew what you should pray and were scared to pray it? I've been there too. It's like, or you say something just out of your thoughts. Yeah, that's a decent prayer. And then when you pray, you're going, oh no. <laughs> what did I ask for? Like I just said, you know, Lord, teach me a lesson. Like, I mean, um, leave me alone. Uh, no, please, well, thank you for your grace. Good night. Yeah. I mean, you start asking God to change you, he will. <laughs> right. So, and it requires your change of mind to be willing to go along with that. Philippians 4, verse 7, we, this is a popular prayer passage here in verse 6 and 7, right? Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So the thanksgiving there, you have to know what God's done for you. Let your request be made known unto God. The request comes after the giving of thanks, after the rejoicing of the Lord, after knowing the gospel in verse 3. But he says in verse 7, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, which means you've come to an understanding, right? The passing understanding doesn't mean you don't need to understand. It means after you've understood these things and you're giving thanks and you're making requests, then the peace of God. If you've ever been in a place in Christianity where you're like, I don't have the peace of God, I don't know what that is experientially. Well, God wants you to understand and learn. So maybe the learning of it will produce the peace of the Spirit, right? Here, praying is part of that equation. It says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice what he says, when we pray... God keeps your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ, through Christ Jesus. You're praying to be kept in Christ. 
not because you're going to lose your salvation, not positionally. You're praying that your mind and heart will be kept on Christ. You're praying so that you will actually do that which you should, which is for Christ's sake and not for your own sake. Amen. That's the request he's talking about. He says, you're careful, you're, you're full of care. It's probably because you're not acknowledging what God has done for you and the largeness and the greatness, the breadth and depth and height of his love toward you. And when you understand that, past that understanding is peace that will keep your heart and your mind in Christ and not the circumstance and the flesh and vanity and temporality. And that's what prayer does. You say, why should I pray? Because we live in temporality. We live in the flesh. We live with concerns and needs and troubles and strife and griefs. And, and prayer helps keep us in Christ in our mind and our heart. Because you'll start living according to your flesh and not the spirit. Right? You won't be doing things for Christ's sake, but for your own sake. Thinking that that's what God wants you to do, do things for your own sake. Because he loves me, right? He loved you to die for you. So that you would die and serve him. So how do we pray under grace? Well, the popular prayer position is eyes closed, heads bowed, folded hands, right? On knees and in a closet. You know, some people do that in private. The unpopular prayer position is as a member of Christ's body, as dead people, crucified, yet living. Amen. That's the unpopular but biblical position to pray, right? Ephesians 4, Paul says we should speak the truth in love, that we may grow up into him who is the head of all things, right? What are you doing when you pray? You just speak, don't you? You should speak truth or lies. Truth. You should pray that you might grow up into him in all things. Why do we pray that I might grow up into Christ? He's the head of all things. Because you're a member of his body and he's the head. And you're together. You're united. You're one. And when you pray, you're engaging the spiritual in your position. And you acknowledge who you are. And now me and Christ are one. We're together. He made me that way, but now I'm acknowledging it. My heart and mind is kept there because I'm praying. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll end here. Paul has another prayer here, a lesser known of Paul's prayers, but nonetheless a sufficient prayer under grace. And he says, Wherefore also, in verse 11, 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 11, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. These people are saved. They've been called of God to be members of the body of Christ, to, and they're, they're preaching the gospel. They're facing persecution for it, and they're enduring through that. So Paul's just overjoyed at these guys and how they're walking in what God would have them do. And he says, we pray that he would count you worthy of this calling, which is to say that you'd walk worthy, right? And fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. Notice what he's praying for. He doesn't pray, that I, I pray that God would give you all your dreams. Right? He prays that what would be fulfilled is the good pleasure of his goodness. God's will be done, right? And the work of faith with power. Well, where, where's that power? We covered last week. That power is spiritual in your spirit, not in your flesh. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, because that's who you are. He's the head of the body that you're a part of. Right? The name of the Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you. That's Christ in you. That's the mystery. May be glorified in you and you in him. Right? According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not talking here about the name of Jesus Christ according to the covenants. He's talking about the name of Jesus Christ according to the grace of our God and what he's doing today. Right? So he prays that, that the name of Jesus Christ will be glorified in you and you in him according to God's grace. So if you struggle with prayer, a good prayer might just be for Jesus' sake, glorify yourself in me Amen. because I'm in you. Right? All right, any questions or comments about today's lesson on prayer?